So precision takes time, therefore precision is expensive. And that's why these V-blocks are extremely cheap because they're not very precise. It's probably the cheapest set of V-blocks that money can buy. Overseas, fly cut, rougher than a cob, V-blocks. Now, I don't have a set this size that are any that are accurate. And what I'd like to do is at least get started turning this into a relatively precise set. Now, surprisingly, these are within a couple thousandths of each other. And uh, for what you pay for them, that's pretty good. And you don't buy these with the intention of using them on your more jig bore. You buy them with the intention of using them on the drill press, potentially the milling machine. So, you know, you get what you pay for. So I have the tooling to turn these into something more accurate. I would like to increase their accuracy by 20 times at least get them within a couple tenths of each other so let's at least get started on this because i don't have a set of v blocks that are any good that are this size and it's something that i want to do so the first thing that i'm going to do with these is grind one side of them and establish a reference and then i'm going to use that surface that i grind well i'm going to flip them and grind the other side after I do the reference surface. Then I'll use that reference surface to mount to my other reference surface to do all the other sides. And I'll show you that as well. I gotta set up all my stops. I'm gonna mark these so I don't forget which side's reference, although I'm not for sure it'll actually matter. So. So man, that made a heck of a mess. That shot all over me, in my face, in my beard, on my toolbox, probably three gallons out on the floor. Now the reason why it, this line came off is because, for one, it's not set up properly. When I turn off the, the coolant up here at the grinder head, it deadheads the pump. The output of that pump has nowhere to go. All that pressure builds in the line. That's a pretty stout little pump. And plus, what I was using was a compression fitting a Teflon ferrule, which is pretty slippery in itself, on plastic tubing. So once that pressure built in the line, when I shut off that valve, it just pushed this tubing right out of the fitting, and then we had a fountain of coolant. So what I'm going to do to... Let me get, a little, get you a little closer and show you these ferrules. So what I'm going to do, because I don't have the fittings that I need here, uh, to do it the right way. I'm just going to put a bypass in here. That way a bit of the coolant always get returned right back to the uh, to the tank and I'm going to use a brass ferrule instead of a Teflon ferrule. Ideally I should have an insert in this soft tubing to hold it, but I don't. So This should work. If it doesn't, we'll just spray the coolant out on the floor again. 
Little frog. So now that I've got this space and this space nice and parallel with each other, nice and flat, I took the block, mounted it to my granite square that has the inserts in it. They're steel inserts. I'm indicating it in, making sure that you know it's really, really close, and that this surface here is proud of the top, that way I can set this block on the grinder because it has steel inserts in it on the side that's on the plate right now and on this side I can grind this, I can flip this 90 degrees on the surface grinder and then grind this surface here. Then I can take this off of the granite block and then use those surfaces that I ground as reference on the mag chuck and grind in the other two. So that's how I plan to get all these surfaces parallel and square with each other. So there it is, set up on the grinder. Now, some people may say, you probably shouldn't use your granite on the grinder. As long as it's cleaned really well, I don't slide it around on any goop or grit, it's not gonna hurt a thing. All my holes are blocked up. I can't think of any other reason why this would have metal plugs in it other than to hold down to a magnetic chuck. And plus, I don't do inspection work anyway, so it'll be fine. So this granite square was a gift from my buddy Andrew, who came down and helped me when I was sheeting the roof. A lot of you guys who watched those videos will remember him. He brought me this along with some other stuff that he had... Uh, picked up in an auction score and <laughs> this thing was so dirty when I got it this uh, granite block that I put it in a bucket of water to let it soak it was so greasy and dirty it probably took me an hour of scrubbing it with a brush and dishwashing liquid to till it came clean so it's not in calibration it's not some super precise piece but it's perfect for this kind of work and having those metal plugs embedded in it is uh, is awesome because it like you see can be used on the mag chuck it had to be custom ordered that way nice piece to have I'm freaking out. Yeah, yeah. That little guy. Tell mommy to keep you safe. Look at the tail. It's so pretty. It's not me. He'll be full grown in the next month. Next few weeks. So here's the setup that I'm going to use to grind the V's in the blocks. Now this is a sign vise, a grinding vise that is adjustable. It's got two rolls, four inches apart. This is a stack of precision gauge, gauge blocks. Got them with to the tenth, which is plenty good enough. I mean, what are you going to? You got to ask yourself how accurate does it need to be for your uses? And I'm not grinding optical glass so this should be more than accurate enough you could really set this up with a set of precision angles right? you can buy those really cheap but all this stuff can be had pretty cheap these days especially the gauge blocks where at one time you know, only big companies could afford a nice set of gauge blocks now I mean they're in the within the reach of most people the cheap overseas set of gauge blocks will do the majority of stuff that most of us are going to do um, this sign vise, new to the shop, this was a gift from Joel and Tessa, the folks that come down from Colorado that also brought the angle, the cast angle that I showed last week. He brought me this, he brought me this, he brought me that nice hand-forged uh, bottle opener and along with some drills and some 
tool steel drops. So I appreciate that. Um, I'll get quite a bit of use out of this thing. So there we go. Should be plenty good enough for my needs. So I'm gonna stick these in the vise, take them over to the grinder, dress them, flip them, and it should be done. So unfortunately, to grind this, I'm gonna have to change the wheel. The wheel that's on it's just not big enough. And uh, I don't have any extra wheel hubs. I hate to take this off the hub because it grinds so well, but that's the way it goes, right? You get a wheel good and balanced, you want to leave it alone. Unless you only have one hub. I haven't yet made a wrench for this, or at least if I did, I don't remember making it. And I sure don't know where it's at. This is left-handed. At least it wasn't crazy tight. Thank you, love. Appreciate that. I'm gonna drink my coffee first. I said I'm gonna drink my coffee first. It's more important. So there are a few things better, in my opinion, than a really nice day outside that you don't have to actually do anything, right? Your time is yours. With a cup of coffee in the shop, it's nice. Doing setups that you enjoy. Now this, I've never ground a set of e-blocks before in my life, so this is the first set ever. I'm not saying this is how you do it, it's just a way to do it that I'm sure will work. Never got a great finish with that wheel that's on there. I have used it before. It'll work fine for the, for the needs that I have for these blocks. I'm sure it's probably a combination of the grinder and the person running it as to why. But grinding is a uh, deep subject for sure. There's a lot to it. It's not just as simple as making some sparks and turning some handles. The, if you want really good stuff, it's, it takes some skill. It's really nice to be able to use my equipment now. It's, that's, it feels so good to be able to just you know work in here with my machines and not have some big glaring hole uh, that needs repaired. There's still a lot to do. I gotta run wires to these machines, to this one, the drill press, because right now they're just draped across the floor. I have to run those in the attic. I'm gonna pour this front pad, this section of front pad, probably at the this fall, maybe uh, sometime around then. That's what I'm hoping anyway, finish this concrete out. And then probably pour an apron, hoping, you know, finances allow if finances allow, um, an apron out in front of the shop, that would be so nice. A con tapered concrete apron with an awning over it so you could pull a car up on there and work on it if you wanted to. And then potentially a little shed of some sort out back, not something uh, uh, elaborate, just somewhere to keep all my uh, non-shop related tools like yard equipment and shovels and so on so it doesn't clutter up my workspace. Got cabinets left to hang, and you name it. Siding left to do. Shop's nowhere near done, uh, but it is good enough to use. And uh, now I can do a little bit of everything. You know, it, it's nice.
nice to be there. It took a long time. So once I'm fed all the way up to the back of the block, it's really close to the edge of the grinding wheel and you could easily crash a setup like this. So I've got a zero set on my dial that I just watch for um, each pass, but it wouldn't take much to run this whole setup into the edge of that grinding wheel, you know, causing yourself some, some big problems. So now that I've got this side of the blocks matched, I can take these blocks, I can flip them, I can grind down to the same point, then I'll dress the wheel and flip them a couple more times, grinding down to the same point on each side. That way the V is centered in the block and then they both match. So that old worn grinder is still more accurate than a milling machine. So these are nice, probably within a couple tenths of each other. Um, that's what I'm guessing. Nice matched set that are square and parallel on every face. So finish is not that great, but I never get a perfect finish on that uh, grinder. So there we go. They just need a good deburring. Get some real meat hooks on them. So if you buy a set of e-blocks like that and you got a surface grinder, you can turn them into a, a decent user set. Um, you know, you can consider those of e-blocks that you buy a kit. There you go, turned into a nice set. So as you can see, I'm still not finished with my siding. I just decided I'd stop on it until the weather got better and warmed up enough to where the ground would actually dry some. Because right now all of this is ladder work and it's not, I don't want to be on a ladder on this hillside in the mud. It's just not, not very safe. But I did put some stakes in the ground, drove them in, I tie wire to it and then hook the feet, the bottom feet of my ladder to that wire. That way I can angle the ladder more I'll finish that up one of these days. So check that out, third and final cabinet hung above the workbench. Turned out really nice, I think it looks really good. I was concerned that it was gonna shade the workbench from the light, which it does, but I put a light under here, so not a problem. I was also concerned that they would block me from putting anything you know, tall on the workbench. These are 16 inches deep, so they stand off quite a bit from the wall, but. And I was like, well, you know, I can always scoot the workbench out in that off occasion that I get something that needs to go on this bench that's taller than the clearance that I have available. So it turned out really good. I'm happy with the way that it looks. I'm glad that I've got all that storage space now. And pretty much this area, other than arranging my tooling and stuff, is, is done. So I'm over here at the welding bench making sure that this torch of mine is set up proper for a cutting job that I have out here in the driveway. It's just a quick job of cutting some 3 8 inch thick plate steel or ten, up to 10 millimeters. And there's a variety of tips that you can get with these torches depending on the thickness of material that you're cutting. And this says 4 3 8 material that I should be using a SC12-0, which is this one. It's a really nice torch. Now, I've never cut steel with it. I have done some brazing jobs. Up until this point, I've only had experience with the Victor torches, which are a little cheaper than this. Do the same thing. This is just more industrial version. So make sure that I'm set up proper with both the tip and my regulator pressure. And I'll show you that uh, on these uh, 
These are Victor regulators and they're almost foolproof. Almost. Let me show you them and uh, we'll go out here and cut some steel. So these are the regulators that I'm using on my tank setup. These are the Edge series. They're made by Victor and they're really nice because they give you on the scale they can tell you both when your tanks are full or getting close to empty and they also tell you where you should be set or at least give you a range of where you should be set for cutting, heating, welding, you know, it's all the, all the same on your oxygen and your fuel. So really nice set of regulators. I like these a lot. I mean, they make it easy to get set up. So there's a little closer look at the oxygen regulator. Now the fuel or the acetylene regulator is set up in the same manner. You can see you have weld in the green, you have cut in the blue, and you have heat in the orange and they overlap here a bit it's going to be job specific on whereabouts you set it and then on your tank pressure uh, gauge it shows you when your tank is full when you're getting close to empty or when you're in the medium range and then empty and it's the same on the uh, on the fuel regulator as well so that's nice the way that those are set up Torch cuts beautifully. I had the settings off just a little in the beginning, but this is the first time I ever used that. There we go. And the circle cutters are nice, but yeah, you know, plasma cutters are nice as well. But if you need to cut something round, those will work for you. So there is you a little better look at my circle cutting attachment. I probably made this in an hour over five years ago probably. So it's just a thrown together unit, but it works well. And obviously you could refine this a lot more than, than what this one is, but it has the basics and it works. These are just sliders to keep your torch positioned at about the right height off the work. This is your center. So you just punch a hole that keeps you located. You can adjust your radius by moving this in or out really simple shop project to make you can also buy them but that's mine and it works because I don't cut a lot of circles but when I do you know, it gets the job done so check out the new addition to the shop man I'm proud to bring this thing in here a lot of you guys already know what it is but if you don't it is a Gershner tool chest now these things are they're handmade and fitted right up north from me in Ohio in the, I believe the same factory that they've been made in since the early 1900s. And uh, you can still buy one of these today. There's a lot of these out there and they're 
extremely well-made uh, toolboxes. Now you can buy one of these, and people do, to use in the shop every day as just your standard machinist toolbox. And then some people will, will buy these to display in their house for jewelry or who knows what, everything, because they're just a quality box. Now this was a gift from my buddy Ron White up in Connecticut, and I, I appreciate it. And I've had this thing for about a month and haven't showed it because of what it had to go through in order to get to me. And I'll tell you that story in just a minute. I didn't know that I was even going to be able to keep this thing. It was that much of an ordeal. But let me show you the box, then I'll tell you the story. Because it's sad, to be honest. But, uh, you know, now it's part of the box's history, I guess. So check out how nice this thing is. It's made of oak. I think it was called tiger wood because of the unique... Uh, grain pattern that this wood has, a lot of stripes and stuff in it. Pretty neat. All the hardware on this box is original. It has been cleaned up. Ron is a woodworker. He went over, polished up all the hardware, cleaned up the wood, and it is in extremely nice shape for its age. It's from, I believe, the 60s or the 70s. Hopefully you can see that uh, grain pattern in this box. Now this is a well-used box, but it is in pretty decent condition. The felt in it is original. He did not want to have to strip that out and replace it and remove all the history from the box. But, you know, as far as its appearance, he cleaned it up as, as good as what's needed. Now, a wood box is really good to keep your tools in because it seems to help keep them from rusting. I guess it blocks a lot of the humidity that uh, you would get in a metal box. So look how nice that is putting my machinist handbook in the drawer that is specifically designed for a machinist handbook. And in the top of the box here, he sent some of the things that were tucked up in behind the drawers from the original owner, who's probably long gone by now, I would guess. So let's see, I haven't even looked in this thing to see what's in it yet. So just some dimensions from the, from the guy that uh, was gonna Probably, probably a project that he was going to make. Cut up 21 and a half, something, some cut list. A piece of high speed steel. And I don't know what this, oh, it's a pull knob. Maybe, maybe Ron had to replace a pull knob, I'm not for sure. And then uh, the key. Hmm. I didn't even look in that yet. I wonder if it even works. does. That's nice. A lot of times you don't get the key with them, but you can have, you can order a key. The number is on the box and you can call up Gershner and they will cut you a key and send it to you. So missing the key is not a big deal. So that is extremely nice. Let me show you a little better view inside of the top. You can see they have a nice mirror there so you can check your appearance before you start working on the lathe. So there's a little better look at the mirror, and it's simply pinned onto the lid. Looks like either a stainless or an aluminum bracket. A little bit odd to have a mirror in a, in a toolbox, but if you think about the era that these were you know, designed and built in, people would wear suits and ties to go to work in a machine shop. And you can see these lock, these little spring-loaded plungers here, these lock the front cover onto the box, and they even go to the trouble to put metal... Uh, inserts in the top of the lid that way it, these don't wear into the lid just a really nice box let me show you the tag on this thing and then i'll tell you the story <laughs> what i know about the story of this box anyway so this is an item that i can't say well they don't make them like that anymore because they actually do they still make these things and you can still buy one brand new and there's a bunch of them out there. You can pick them up on the used market. I've seen people pick them up for 50 bucks. You know, people just don't know what they have, or they're all dingy and dirty from years of being handled with dirty hands or missing some hardware, which is not a big deal because you can still buy all this stuff from Gershner, you know, and, and replace it with the original, original equipment. So if you see one, you know, pick it up. They are impressively well made. So. Now the sad thing about this box is that it has survived since late 60s, early 70s, up until 
very recent with no damage at all. And that's a testament to the build quality of these things because anything that survives in a machine shop environment for that long, you know, has to be pretty well made. Now, chances are somebody fed their family out of this thing and uh, you hate to see them get damaged and that's what happened to this one just recently. When it was shipped to me from Ron in Connecticut through UPS, it just got probably dropped or thrown out of the back of a truck and got some damage that I'll share with you. But, and it wasn't because this thing wasn't packed well. It was in a box that's much bigger, packed in a box that was much bigger than this thing. Foam all around it, top, bottom. The corners were reinforced with a cardboard reinforcing. Ron actually worked at a packing company, so he knows, he knows packing. Um, it was just total disregard for what was in the box during its transit here. Fragile stickers all over the box. The shipping companies see those so much that they do, don't pay any attention to those. They do absolutely no good. So unfortunately, it did get damaged in shipping. And uh, whether I fix it or not, you know, we'll see. It's still kind of up in the air because it, it still functions. And I'll, I'll show you how, how badly this thing was damaged um, on one corner. Now, the reason I haven't showed it up to this point is because I wasn't for sure I was going to even be able to keep this thing or not because of the insurance claim with UPS. You know, sometimes they want the item. Uh, that's what I was told. And uh, I didn't want to show it if I wasn't going to be able to keep it. So let me show you the damage on this thing. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll fix it. So I wish I would have took pictures before I snapped this thing back together, but it is split all the way down this corner. It tweaked the hinges on the top of the box. This thing was crushed this way. It bent this screw so bad that I had to pull it out and straighten it. And to bend a, that screw, those are pretty heavy duty, uh, took a lot of force. So this thing was thrown out of a truck probably onto this corner and it was hanging open it was hanging open that wide, this break. Now, you probably, I mean, it doesn't look that severe, but trust me, uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, I popped it back together uh, to see if it would still fit back together. There was chunks of it laying in the box that I put back into place. They're still not in there perfect. But really, what it needs is this part replaced and this side replaced to fix it back to where, you know, an unbroken condition. I don't think that I'm gonna do that. I think that you could probably pull it back open, you know, line up the grain again, and squeeze it with some quality wood glue. There was pieces of this thing that I stuck back in there from where it kind of splintered out. But yeah, that's unfortunate that, you know, they, they did that because it took a lot of force to break this box. They're, they're not put together, uh, you know, flimsy. So here on the workshop desk is where I decided I'd keep this Gershner tool chest. I'm going to use it for some of my finer tools because that's what it's designed for. There's not a lot of room in one of these, but they'll hold a lot of nice, small precision instruments. I'm going to use it for layout just drawing, light inspection, stuff like that, and decoration, because it's good at that as well. But you get the idea of a nice Dayton, Ohio, since 1906 is when uh, the company was started. And I think they've been in the same building since like 1915. They're still there, still making these boxes, and it's pretty impressive. My buddy Adam Booth did a thorough video on Gershner. He even went to the factory, had a box of his reconditioned, did a tour, and if you're interested in that, get in the YouTube searches, look up A-Bomb 79 Gershner, and you'll see what I mean. It's a pretty impressive outfit. So, thank you, Ron. I appreciate the box. You know, keep your eyes open. You, know, you can have one for yourself. Probably pretty cheap if you're lucky, because there is a lot of them out there. So in video before last, we started tearing into the Dual milling machine head here in order to clean out two oil fittings that were designed to take a light oil that had been pumped full of grease, heavy grease in the past and were completely clogged up. Therefore, the sections that they were supposed to lubricate would have never got oil again unless we did that. So we had to tear it down to this point. Now that those are cleaned out, 
what I need to do is change the grease in this power down feed gearbox and the high and low speed gearbox up here in the head because after 40 years, it deserves a grease change. And I've got some good quality stuff over there to use. So let's get started pulling this grease out and then I'll show you what I've bought to replace this nasty stuff with. So when you'd shine a light on this grease, you could easily see all the bronze particles from those uh, bevel gears. You know, just normal, normal gear wear. But after 40 years, it's, it's due for a change. So this is diesel fuel, not gas. I just don't have a yellow gas jug. So I'm just washing out the bottom of this uh, reservoir. I've got a pan down there. I'm catching the, the mess in. Um, not really trying to get this thing super clean. I just want to get all the any of the debris and stuff that's in there out from the from the bronze gears. And I called these uh, spur gears. That's a worm gear. So while this gearbox is relatively clean and we can kind of see the workings, I want to give you my best understanding of how this thing works. Now this is the gearbox for the power down feed. So power comes from the motor down through this worm gear here into this shaft that has selectable speeds. It gets transferred down into this shaft here, which is connected to your handle and powers this worm, which powers this shaft here that goes back and has a gear on it that hooks into the back of the quill and pushes it down. So this is the mechanism here that engages the, this worm gear to the quill. So you can engage it and it hooks in these, uh, these teeth here, which is also a slip mechanism, kind of on a, on a spring, I guess. So it can't, it can't push too hard or it'll disengage or slip. Once it reaches the bottom, where you've set on the front of the machine here, it hits this lever, which disengages, and then you're free to raise the quill uh, manually, you know, and reset. So, in a nutshell, that's how it works. But chances are your mill, if you have one, has got a very, very similar setup to this. You know, they're not going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's been around for a long time. This kind of uh, arrangement. So, there you go. That's my best understanding of it. So replacing the grease in this milling machine head was kind of a tough decision. A lot of people had different opinions on what I should use. It was hard to get a good clear answer. There are a lot of options, although you know, a lot of those options revolve around how much heat that it's gonna see, how fast is the gears turning, how much load does the gears see. You know, there's a, it, 
Lubrication is a huge topic, and this is what I decided to go with. The Valvoline Heavy Duty Palladium with the 3% Molly. Now this is an NLGI number two grease that should serve our needs just fine in this gearbox. It's not high temperature, it's not high speed. There is two worm gears in there that see a lot of shear, and that's why I decided to, to go with the Molly. And check out the Molly if you're, uh, if you're curious. Uh, from my best understanding, it's like platelets naturally occurring elements, really small and good for shear or high load applications. So this stuff should last and serve this gearbox for a long time. The majority of the gears in there are straight cut spurs, but you know, if you can go with the good stuff, why not? So uh, this is what I chose. Now I went with the tubes because I want to use what's left in my grease guns. And uh, it's not that big a deal to spatula this stuff out and shove it in the head of that milling machine. So that's what I chose to go with. That's pretty good stuff. So it looks like it's going to take about two tubes of grease for this gearbox, about 28 ounces from the best that I can tell. And if we use a little more than what they did originally, yeah, it's not going to hurt a thing as long as we don't majorly overfill this thing. And that new grease is awesome. It really clings to those teeth and moves up. That old stuff had just settled all the way to the bottom of this case, which this will do over time as well. You know, got hard. Now by weight, I just took a male scale and weighed what I pulled out of here, you know, and then added a little bit from what would leak out or what we lost, just didn't get into the box. So you get the idea, it's close, and that's all it needs to be is close. This will last forever. Yeah, probably if you barely had any grease in there at all, it lasts forever. So there we go. There we go. I'll just kind of clean that up and that part's done. So unfortunately that looks like it's it this week. I was really hoping to get this thing buttoned up and all back together. That was what I was planning, but you know, plans don't always work out. In fact, they seldom work out. <laughs> That's the way it seems anyway. Luckily, no damage in here, just common wear in the power down feed, which they don't get used a ton anyway. So I'm not really surprised, but it's good. And I don't see any damage up top, but there is a ton of grease in, in this top portion that has to come out. And there's no easy way to get that out of there other than one spoon at a time. But luckily, you only have to do this stuff once. So <laughs> That's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who supported me on this project or my YouTube adventures in general. Don't forget the thumbs up button. It helps. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes.